thank you for joining. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining. I see the, the expert advisory group slowly coming in. Uh, so those are the panelists, but we also have uh, attendees, observers. This is uh, the last official webinar of the expert advisory group that was conveyed to produce the early warning, the strategic framework for early warning of animal health threats. Um, this, EIG, this webinar is attended by the expert advisory group as panelists, so they are able to put up their hands and, uh, and have a discussion. This is still a discussion, but today we are also joined by a number of observers who are here. To, they can watch the discussions and they can post questions on the Q&A. So those who are attending webinar mode, you can post your, your questions in written on the QA. Um, but today, what we wanted is to present to you the result of the work that started in May with the expert advisory group. But it's a steward discussion meeting, so all the expert advisory group can, can raise their hands and participate in the discussion. Today, we have some welcome words from the head of MPRESS. Uh, which I will share with you now, and I will continue speaking after her welcome notes. Hi, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, and thanks a lot for joining. Uh, my name is Madhur, and I'm going to just give a brief overview of the FAO Strategic Framework for Early Warning of Animal Health Threats. Thank you all for joining this meeting. Uh, so, okay, so FAO's work and activities focusing on supporting the transformation of agri-food systems to be more sustainable, inclusive, and resilient. And FAO does this work through the four betters and its 20 priority programs. So you can see the four betters here, transformation, to support better life, better production, better environment, and better nutrition. Uh, the work on the early warning framework is nested within the One Health program of FAO, which supports better production, uh, and it aims to ensure sustainable production and consumption patterns through inclusive food and agriculture supply chains at local, regional, and national level. Uh, ensuring resilient and sustainable agri-food systems in a changing climate and environment. So the work on early warning is really part of ensuring that agri-food systems are resilient to the threats that come their way. Now, um, through our One Health program, we aim to support countries to achieve uh, SDG targets related to SDG 1, uh, specifically target 1.5, uh, building resilience to economic and social disasters, uh, target 3D, which is improving early warning systems for global health risks, and target 15.8, which is preventing alien invasive species in land and water ecosystems. Uh, now, these are the primary SDG indicators. And the first one really relates to the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. The second one relates to strengthening um, capacities for health emergency preparedness, good health and well being. Uh, and 15.8 uh, relates to the prevention and control of pests and diseases and invasive alien species. And this one is really related to biodiversity targets. Now, how do we achieve this work? Uh, we, we focus on these five thematic areas of work or five pillars, as we call them, uh, within FAO's One Health program. And as you can see, um, improved early warning systems is one of the key thematic areas of FAO's One Health program. And that then contributes to improved biosecurity for pest and disease management, uh, contributes to better emergency preparedness and response, contributes to risk management for antimicrobials, and um, it also contributes to safeguarding the environment and biodiversity risks. 
And all this is underpinned by adequate workforce capacities, investments and infrastructure at all levels. Uh, now, we follow the early warning framework adopted by the UN, specifically for this strategic framework on early warning. Uh, and we seek inspiration from the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, uh, we translate this framework into a more uh, people-centered framework that supports livelihoods, um, which includes reducing direct threats to human health caused by zoonotic diseases, as well as the threats to food security, and uh, economic uh, threats that can be caused by animal diseases. Um, now, uh, the, the definition is a very One Health definition uh, of this early warning framework where communication, collaboration, coordination and capacity building are all, all core of this early warning framework. Uh, so that um, the impacts caused by animal diseases uh, are, are also uh, communicated uh, to the wider range of stakeholders, but are also the wider range of stakeholders and disciplines are also involved in, in providing uh, inputs to this early warning framework. Uh, now, uh, this work started last November uh, when we had uh, organized the first global consultation in FAO headquarters to initiate this work. And then it has, it has continued thanks to the work of the dedicated um, expert advisory group. And I really want to extend a huge thanks and a shout out to all of you. Who, who gave who gave uh, their time and expertise. Um, we received more than 120 applications uh, from which 74 were chosen to compose the expert advisory group and you have given a lot of time and expertise to this early warning framework and thank you all together uh, for that for that support. Uh, so, this team has been meeting since uh, May, um, and today we are very pleased to, to deliver the, the draft framework, the result of all this hard work. So with that, uh, I pass it over to, to Fernanda for the next uh, set of slides. Thank you. Over to you, Fernanda. So with that, I couldn't second uh, Madhuri's words more of thanking the EIG for all the work that led to what we can present to you today. So I'll pick up straight from where she left. Um, to say that, uh, as she pointed out, we arrived at this framework as a translation of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Uh, so we are translating what this means for animal health in considering what we're preparing for to be animal health threats. And in doing that, we kept with the four components of the uh, risk reduction framework, which is based on understanding and monitoring risks, doing surveillance, in our case, to detect cases of animal diseases, effective communication, and then using this information for decision support. We've kept those four pillars, those four components, and we've translated it to a specific scope of infectious diseases in animals or zoonotic diseases. Um, and so this is just a, a brief overview of the scope of the framework. So what are we considering him to be the threats we're preparing against? And those are infectious animal diseases. We adopt a system approach. So how do we strengthen surveillance systems as a whole to improve early warning systems? So we're not, this framework's not going to talk about developing any new systems and it doesn't expect that countries will take the burden of developing systems new. It's assuming that all countries already have surveillance in place and talks, guides countries in strengthening that specifically to improve early warning. 
The early warning framework also is focused on supporting early action, but it does not cover action. It doesn't cover response to emergencies. In fact, it's not restricted to diseases that cause uh, emergencies and uh, emerging diseases. Sorry, that's what I meant. So the AIG felt strongly that if we're going to help countries build systems, those systems should be robust to improve early detection and animal health as a whole, and not just against emerging diseases. We understand that no single strategy will work for improving early warning in every country. So this document is a very high level goal setting document that says this is where we are all walking towards and FAO is committed to continue developing instruments to help countries get there. But this is the first step, is setting the goal. The expert advisory group has helped us set what an ideal early warning system looks like and setting some landmarks for countries to orient what they already do towards this goal. We are interpreting early warning to mean anything that can reduce the time between two of those nodes in this picture. So whether we're talking about monitoring risks before diseases even happen, or detecting diseases faster, even notifying faster, diagnos diagnos diagnosing faster, notifi reporting faster, or taking action fa faster. All of this is being interpreted as early warning in this framework. With that, I should really give the floor to the expert advisory group. The, as Madur said, the expert advisory group is composed of more than 70 people who have kindly been donating their time and expertise. And today we've asked this group, we have asked for volunteers to represent each of those four components. So we've been working as a group, first everyone, and then we've broken into uh, expertise groups for these four components. And one person from the AIG per component will give presentations. We've recorded those presentations. And after each presentation, we're going to have a, a dynamic session of questions and answers. Um, so to kick this off, I will bring up the presentation of the expert advisory group member who is representing all of those who contributed to developing the early warning framework component of uh, surveillance. And if the sharing doesn't go well, I ask Marta to please interrupt me, otherwise I'll just play and assume everything is going well. Hi, my name is John Berezowski. I'm a professor in disease surveillance at Scotland's Rural College, and I have prepared a short presentation on the surveillance component of this framework. The outcomes we are proposing for this chapter are that if a country uses this guidance and operationalizes agile and responsive early warning surveillance. It should be able to improve detection of all prioritized diseases, identify changes in epidemiological parameters of endemic diseases, um, identify clinical suspicions of high consequence diseases and disease syndromes with maximum coverage, maximum timeliness, maximum efficiency in all populations under surveillance. The impact of having improved early warning surveillance within a country are that there will be earlier detection of emerging diseases, re-emerging diseases, new diseases and new strains of diseases, as well as changes in epidemiological parameters that are risk factors for disease. And this should apply to all populations under surveillance. More effective early warning surveillance will provide earlier detection, which will give disease control officers in these countries more time to mount effective uh, uh, responses and interventions that ultimately will reduce the burden of these diseases in the country. We are proposing a stepwise process for countries to use this framework. They will begin by evaluating their current surveillance activities to see whether they are fit for purpose. This will allow them to identify gaps where improvement is needed, and this will allow them to identify additional surveillance activities and other changes that will improve their surveillance systems. Finally, we will provide guidance on identifying enabling factors for improving surveillance. This uh, framework does not provide detailed instructions on how to 
implement or operationalize surveillance activities. This information is well described elsewhere and we have provided, provided links to that information within the framework. We have identified four targets for improvement of early warning surveillance systems. We begin by examining disease reporting systems, and then we look at how um, to supplement reporting systems with additional surveillance activities. This is followed by data and diagnostic capacity, and we end with uh, how to generate actionable information from surveillance data. We begin with disease reporting systems, simply because disease reporting systems are the foundation of and the livestock surveillance systems worldwide. And in many countries, disease reporting systems are the only surveillance systems that are available for livestock. We provide guidance on how to review and evaluate reporting procedures, organizational support and legislation, and how to follow up on um, important events identified in the disease reporting system. The ultimate uh, aim is to determine whether the country's disease reporting system can detect disease, report it, and follow up. The framework provides guidance on how to identify the activities and enablers needed to provide confidence that new or prioritized diseases can be detected and reported by the disease reporting system. Once the reporting system has been evaluated, countries are encouraged to think about how they can supplement their reporting systems. In order to do that, we have to take a little bit of a break and look at, at how a surveillance operates and how we design surveillance. So surveillance is a group of activities that produce information. That information is used to make decisions with respect to disease control. Whether we sh and those decisions are usually about whether we should intervene in the situation or not, and if we are going to intervene, what sort of intervention is required. And the outcomes of surveillance and disease control are uh, reduced disease and other outcomes such as disease prevention. When we design surveillance, we work in the opposite direction to which surveillance operates. We start by specifying our desired outcomes. We then think about interventions and the decisions we need to make, and then we move on to what information we need our surveillance system to create. Once we've decided on that information, then we can think of which specific activities we can use to, to produce that information. Now, it's important when designing surveillance to recognize that several surveillance activities can produce the same amount of information. So countries are encouraged to think about the activities and then to select those that are best fit to their country's resources and needs. We could also think of surveillance systems using this model. Disease occurs on the left-hand side and something is reported to the reporting system. Then the um, report has to be investigated to confirm whether it is a disease of importance or not. When we add additional surveillance activities, we're adding them into this flow of information. They're not replacing the reporting system, they're just supplementing them. So we've provided many different surveillance activities that countries can select and implement in addition to the reporting system. And um, these additional activities will identify signals after the disease occurs. These will often have to be investigated uh, the same way as um, reports of disease through the reporting system are investigated and then confirmed to determine whether they are disease or not. We have included a wide range of surveillance activities within this chapter. These include anti and postmortem inspection at slaughter, wildlife surveillance, risk-based surveillance, sentinel surveillance, horizon and media scanning, syndromic surveillance, pathogen detection in the environment, genomic surveillance, and arthropod vector surveillance. These are, in many cases, categories. So there's multiple different types of activities that can be included in each one. So, and they can be combined. They're not mutually exclusive. So we could do, for instance, risk-based wildlife surveillance or risk-based um, post-mortem inspection surveillance. 
Uh, we can do syndromic surveillance in sentinels, so they can be combined in different ways depending on the um, needs for surveillance. The first step on deciding which uh, additional surveillance activities to use require, involves um, doing an in inventory and evaluation of all surveillance activities for diseases under surveillance. <clears throat> And the purpose is to determine whether additional activities are needed to improve surveillance coverage, surveillance timeliness, surveillance sensitivity, specificity, or efficiency. Once this is done, users are encouraged to um, consult the framework to select surveillance activities that com can complement reporting-based surveillance. And the goal is, again, to improve coverage, timeliness, sensitivity, specificity, and efficiency. We then move on to the evaluation of the country's diagnostic capacity and data. Diagnostic capacity is essential for early warning surveillance since it is used to confirm disease reports or signals from surveillance, whether they are due to an important disease or not. Our um, evaluation covers the collection of samples in the field, analysis of samples, diagnostic capacity itself, and workflows to generate information. <clears throat> Once this is done, countries can consult the framework to assess and improve these same components, field collection of samples, transport of samples, diagnostic capacity, capacity to store and integrate data, and others. Finally, we provide guidance on generating actionable information from the data. <clears throat> this relates to accurate and timely collection, integration, storage, and analysis of data, and the production of information. Countries can consult the framework for recommendations on many things, including formatting and processing data, developing data flows, different data analysis methods, signal generation and verification, cluster detection analysis, and situational, situational awareness, and others. Again, we do not provide precise directions on how to design and operational or operationalize these different methods as they are well described elsewhere. This ends my presentation. I hope you have found it useful, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Now we thank John for this presentation and for his representation of the team from the expert advisory group who worked on surveillance. And we have a few minutes now for you guys to give your feedback. So you've seen what the, the framework intends to cover on the surveillance chapter. So we're talking about helping countries improve uh, reporting systems, designing surveillance to complement diagnostic, and then using this information in early warning models. What did we forget? What is it that you think, or what you, have you guys thought about this? Are you including this? Or do you want to ask anything? Uh, the panelists can raise their hands. And those who are listening, they can post questions on the, on the question and answer. For those who were in the group that helped shape this component of surveillance, um, I hope they feel well represented by John, but they can complement anything that John maybe forgot to include if there is anything people want to bring up. If not, I will just understand this. You guys can't wait to see the actual document and see what's maybe missing there uh, while I start preparing uh, for, for more. You can still think. Um... Yes. May I? Can you hear me? Are you seeing my hand? Yes. I haven't. I hadn't seen your hand, but I'm hearing you <laughs> now. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John, for this excellent presentation. Uh, can give us really a good uh, overview on how you would like to develop this framework and how it will also uh, link with the early warning. Uh, 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 part early warning for surveillance. Uh, just one question, perhaps uh, 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 you other colleagues can ha have it got it clear. 
uh, how this system can be the early warning uh, for surveillance and the surveillance system can link with the um, information sharing system. Because as you know, if we establish uh, 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 the, for the different type of surveillance a reporting system based on the type of surveillance, it's very good. But how that can be linked with the information sharing system? Because I think both need to go together. That's for me, uh, perhaps if you can uh, provide to me few details or the other members of the group. Over. Thank you, Ismaila. And uh, I let if any of the expert advisory groups would, uh, expert advisory members would like to respond themselves, they can put their hands up. If I miss any hands, Marta will help me. But I will use this as an excuse to go back to the the um, to the framework components. Uh, I was about to explain this as I introduced the next component because. Uh, on the disaster risk reduction frameworks from the United Nations we are translating here, it usually starts with understanding risk. So if you think of disasters as a tsunami or an earthquake, right, those, those uh, frameworks start from understanding where the risks are and then monitoring that something may be happening. As soon as something is detected, disseminating that information, raising alerts, alerting everyone, maybe a tsunami is coming and then support during the problem and then recovery. If you notice, we started our presentation from surveillance, not from the risks. The risks come before disease even happened. But DAG felt strongly that surveillance is where countries feel comfortable. It's the, it's the common ground. It's where we understand what we already do. So we've first thought of surveillance as Okay, let's, let's give the common ground for people to understand what we're talking about when we discuss animal health. And then let's take a step back and say, okay, but could we actually have been monitoring risks? Could the way we monitor disease occurrence, could we apply that one step back and monitor risks that diseases may emerge or that you know epidemiological parameters may worsen? And once we present those two components, so the risk is the one I'm going to present next, then we discuss the communication and information delivery, which is this important part that Smila has just uh, pointed out. So, okay, and John said this in one of the meetings, in surveillance just generates information. That doesn't lead to early action if, as Smila pointed out, we are not connected to a system for communication and information delivery. So that has its own component on the framework. And that we're going to address that after having talked about risks, because it's not important to communicate and inform only on the diseases that we detect, but also on the risks that we're able to map. So incorporating into communication all around what we know about where disease is happening and what we know about where disease may happen, that's all in the communication and information delivery. And I'll try not to jump the gun and uh, present what's already in that chapter. And lastly, we then address decision to support interventions. Yeah, I should have said this in the beginning. The EIG felt strongly that this shouldn't be seen as a cycle. So you see there are no errors here. There is, this is not a cycle. All of those four things may be happening at all times. In particular, for instance, we may take decision first and then communicate, disseminate to the public just as an example. Or we may act already on the understanding of risks. So we really feel strongly that those are four components that join in the middle and not a cycle from one to the next. Um, having said that, um, or I will pause yeah. and Marta has her hand up. So maybe she has an intervention from the QAA. Yes, uh, good morning. So I have four questions in the Q&A. Uh, one of them from Aitzas asks, what are the recommendations to work on the suspected samples from zoonotic diseases in the lab, particularly in resource limited setting? So um, I do feel that's a very specific question. We may not have time for to go that specifically. Uh, what I can say is that the framework as a, that's a really good, uh, I was just saying those things happen at the same time. So in the surveillance one, we'll, we discuss diagnostic capacity in this case and what 
what to do when you don't have the resources, you know, what kind of uh, resources can you have uh, to complement in low settings? What kind of support can be given by other countries? What And then on the communication, we discuss how to communicate across sector in cause, case of zoonotics. Um, so this is a question that is answered in different parts of the framework. Keeping in mind, however, that the framework is still a very high level goal setting document. So it says, ideally, this is how it operates and this is what you should be aiming for. And when I mean ideally, I don't mean with full resources. I don't mean with the best diagnostic labs. I mean, with what you have, this is what you strive to do. Um, but it doesn't go into full, it's not an operational guidance, right? Guide. So it doesn't say to A, B, and C. It just says, here's what your system should be able to, to deliver in the end. Do you want to go to the next question, Marta? Uh, yes. So we have a question from Annie that asks, is there any AI application that can help to proper surveillance and early disease detection? Thank you. And we just had this discussion about AI in, in this specific meeting could mean artificial intelligence, uh, even influenza or even artificial insemination, right? Um, but I know you've been probably talking about artificial intelligence. There is uh, in the enabling environment. So um, one thing I didn't highlight is that around the framework, we always highlight the enabling environment. So for every chapter of the framework, we discuss what are the things you should have in place to make things possible. For instance, the legislative framework, um, the political independence, the workforce capacitation, which is a really important one. Uh, those are things that as we present the framework, we say, okay, but here's the things that should be in place around you for these to work. And one of them is uh, the access to innovation and to technology. And we discuss both the role that that can have in helping early warning, and as well as the role of international organizations in helping level up the field for the countries that have less access to those technologies. Maybe next one, Marja. And mm -hmm. um, sorry, because of the pace, the time, and the structure of the q and I'm just going to have to trust that I'm answering your questions. And if you feel like I didn't answer well, uh, you're just going to have to post in the chat again, and Marta will, will pull me down again on the next uh, next chance we have for discussion. Please, Marta. Uh, so she Shehan asks, did the expert advisory group suggested on developing tools for better surveillance? Uh, we, we didn't know. So what uh, we did was discuss what can be done with the tools that are already in place. So how to best use resources that are already in place. It's, it, we don't give specific guidance on how to design surveillance. We point to resources and our ambition is that after reading the framework, people know when to go to those resources. So how to combine the information available out there to improve early warning to the best of their ability but we did not come up with new tools. And maybe one more, Marta, and then we have to move on. Uh, and then there's a question from Mohamed that asks, how can communication and information delivery between the various stakeholders be improved to ensure rapid and effective intervention in the event of an animal health threat being detected? Are there any successful examples that have been implemented recently in this regard? I will use that as a cue to move on uh, because mm -hmm. we'll get to the communication. But I will say that the expert advisory group has expressed interest to share not just success stories, but also failure stories, right? What we already know doesn't work. So we intend to keep this framework live. It will be published as a document, but we'll try to create a space online where people can keep adding their success stories and their lessons learned, as well as resources. We'll do in the, the written document, we have a lot of resources already and we'll have an access, um, but we'll try to have living examples of the framework. For instance, countries that have tried to apply the framework to improve their early warning, their lessons learned. We, uh, in this project that developed the framework, will apply this framework in three countries and document the lessons learned. So thank you for this question. We'll try to do that. I will keep moving on the interest of time, um, but Marta will keep collecting the, the questions that come through the chat or the Q&A. And as I said, now that we've discussed surveillance, we're just going to go one step back towards 
even earlier than cases happening, whether we can monitor the risks that this has happened before we actually move to the communication that I see it's a, it's a point that a lot of people are eager to, to hear. Um, just bear with me a second and let's first discuss whether we can improve the surveillance we do by monitoring risks before diseases even occur. Hello and welcome. My name is Sharon Calvin. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist and head of One Health Risk Assessment at the Public Health Agency of Canada. It's my pleasure to represent the risk working group today. I'll do my best to provide an overview of our chapter on understanding, monitoring and assessing risks. I'll start by reviewing what we mean by risk monitoring. When we say risk, we mean the likelihood of occurrence and likely magnitude of consequences of an adverse event associated with a hazard. There are many different types of adverse events that we may be interested in, but for infectious diseases, we often mean either an infection, a case of disease, or a cluster of cases. This is represented by the blue oval in the center of this very simplified bow tie diagram. But risks are more than just cases of disease. The landscape surrounding a risk includes not just the adverse event of interest, but also drivers on the left, such as loss of biodiversity or social determinants of health. The impacts on the right, such as cultural impacts or animal welfare issues, and the pathways tying them together. By looking at this full landscape of a risk, early warning can be more anticipatory and not just reactive. We can look at monitoring points further upstream of the adverse event. However, it may also be important to monitor points downstream of the adverse event in order to inform mitigation measures. Surveillance and risk assessment are linked to each other in a feedback loop. Surveillance may uh, trigger the need for a risk assessment. It can be one of many inputs into a risk assessment and it can generate information on risk factors. On the other hand, risk assessment and other risk approaches such as foresight can recommend specific surveillance activities and inform surveillance priorities. The result of this loop is that there's no single right order to the components and we had a fair bit of trouble deciding which to put first in the framework. In the end, we just had to pick one and go with it. In the development of this component, we recognize that most countries' capacity to anticipate risks will undergo incremental improvement over time. Many countries are likely in a position where they have surveillance for cases of disease then followed by reactive risk assessment. The way we've structured the risk monitoring component, it's intended to provide a roadmap to achieve more anticipatory systems. This shift will requiring, require an enabling environment, including a regulatory framework that allows strategies to be informed by risk, the systematic collection, processing, and storing of data in formats that are accessible for risk assessors, a workforce capacity to apply risk assessments and with access to the right resources to do so, and the institutionalization of risk assessment strategies. These are all the subcomponents, including identifying the risk monitoring needs, systematic collection of data on risk indicators, risk modeling methodologies, and risk communication. As with the surveillance and risk components, we struggled with the appropriate order of the subcomponents because they don't always happen in a certain sequence. There will always be situations that are reactive where risk modeling occurs due to specific demands. However, over time, a more systematic mapping of risk monitoring needs as described in the first subcomponent may result in the establishment of a regular schedule of risk monitoring or the documentation of specific triggers that would prompt a new risk assessment. Risk communication is something underlying all the components, so while we put it as section R4, we see it as a continuous process. This first subcomponent is about identifying the risk monitoring needs. In other words, even when you've chosen a specific hazard as a priority, how do you pin down a risk question related to that hazard 
figure out what aspects of that risk landscape should be monitored and decide what data to collect. We describe how exercises can be conducted, whether for individual diseases or groups of diseases, such as tick-borne diseases, that would characterize the diseases, such as with clear case definitions or identifying target areas or populations, map the risk landscape, such as the drivers and impacts and how they all relate to one another, identify possible monitoring points along the risk pathways, and then prioritize these monitoring points using various considerations, such as feasibility, the expected magnitude of risk prevented, association between the monitoring point and the adverse event, and where monitoring points affect multiple adverse events and multiple consequences. As much as possible, this should be complemented with estimations of cost benefit or cost effectiveness. When conducting these exercises, considerations include the engagement of stakeholders and collaboration across sectors. It's important to maintain a One Health perspective. Explicit consideration of the connections between hazards, including the amplifying effects of some hazards on others, and the vulnerabilities and coping capacities of different populations. This second subcomponent touches on how to collect the data. Recommendations are made for cross-sectoral collaboration, such as jointly identifying data sources that can benefit risk monitoring across several sectors, clear setting of communication flows and roles and responsibilities for data collection, monitoring, alert setting, and sharing and the establishment of agreements and interagency protocols for regular data exchange. Recommendations are also made for creating a robust repository of risk indicators and past events of diseases of relevance, including continuously collating data to enable the triggering of models on demand, the development of a maintenance plan to keep data current and updated and in line with the seasonal calendar of risks, and respecting data governance and ensuring digital security. The multi-hazard approach must recognize the importance of multi-sectoral involvement. So the aim should not be to have a single central repository, but to have a network of harmonized and interoperable databases, possibly that are connected and federated with documented strategies for data sharing on demand. This third subcomponent provides an overview on different types of risk modeling strategies, including a description of what it is and when it's used, as well as examples and resources. We knew this wouldn't be an exhaustive list, but the examples we've provided include quantitative and qualitative risk assessments, rapid risk assessments, import risk analysis, and forecasting and foresight models. Andrea created this very useful diagram to illustrate how some methods are more future focused and tend to deal with higher uncertainty and hence be more creative in nature, while other methods look at shorter time frames and can therefore be more defined and predictive. And last but not least, in the communication subcomponent, we address how to use and communicate the results of risk monitoring for incorporation into overall decision making and intervention processes. I should highlight that the next component of the framework is also communication, but we added this subcomponent here to make it explicit that risks should also be communicated, not only the findings of surveillance. In the terrestrial code of the World Organization for Animal Health, risk communication is one component of risk analysis as il illustrated in the diagram here. Some considerations regarding risk communication <clears throat> are having clear roles and protocols for delivering risk information in formats that can be incorporated into all other components of the framework mapping all the stakeholders which should have access to risk information, including animal owners and the general public, and defining when and how they get this information, training a workforce to understand risk information and how to communicate it with other stakeholders, 
And in relation to the incorporation of risk information into decision making, it's important to ensure a legal framework to respond to risks, alignment with international standards, and to ensure the existence of enforcement mechanisms. Hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of what we've tried to do with this component. Thanks for your attention. And I thank Sharon for representing uh, the risk uh, component in the group that worked on this. Um, I tried to answer some questions on the Q&A. Uh, I see that Marta has been marking them as answered as we answered them live. I also have to thank the expert advisory group who not only helped us get here, but I see they have been active answering questions in the chat. So thankful for that. I do not, I cannot uh, monitor the chat. So I'll have to trust that the expert advisory group will either help answering questions there or raise their hands if there are questions there that they think we, we should discuss here. So we have a few more minutes to, as I said, the next component will address the communication that I think um, a lot of people have been hoping to hear. Um, but we have a few more minutes before then, if anyone wants to raise their hand. Fashina, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I don't have any comment on the presentation. I just want to say that people should also be reading the chat, which is on the side as we go on. It will enrich the discussion, even on the presentation, because there are some interesting chat related to the presentation that are going on on the chat also, as well as in the question and answer area. Thank you. Thank you. Because there have been so many discussions about the communication, I think I will just move on to, to that one. And uh, I will stop for, for a bit of discussion again after that. So now we've seen, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get it. Uh, now we've seen what the framework covers in terms of guidance uh, for, Fashina, can you put down your hand, please? Uh, otherwise it's, <laughs> it stays up for me. Um, so. Now we've seen how the framework gives guidance for people to improve surveillance to detect diseases, but also move towards uh, even earlier monitoring risks before disease happen. And all that information collected only leads to early action if we can communicate it effectively and support decision making. Um, so now we're going to to watch what the AIG uh, can present for us in terms of where we came to in the communication component. Hello, everyone. My name is Pablo Alarcón López. I'm a senior lecturer at the Royal Veterinary College in London, and I have the pleasure today to present it to you the communication component um, of the framework we're developing for the early warning of animal health threats. I'm here representing the expert adversary group that is informing this. So in terms of these components, we want to understand what is the, we want to plot first what is the impact of this um, chapter of the communication that needs to happen. Um, so any signal in terms of disease risk, prevalence, burden, or risk factors, uh, we think needs to be communicated effectively and efficiently uh, within and across sectors. Effectively means that it needs to be able to lead to decision process and to inform actions. While efficient means that it needs to be done rapidly, cost-effective, and it needs to reach everyone that needs to have this information, including the public and international networks. Um, the outcomes of a communication um, strategies will be that you have developed clear workflows for communications that are supported um, by legislation and with good SOPs. The communication needs to be systematic in way of the channels, but also the information that is used. And obviously, the information that has to be communicated needs to be transparent, including what are the risks, uh, the uncertainty, the limitation, and the biases of the information, and what are the needs of the different sectors. We have different sections within this chapter um, that involves about communication within sectors, between sectors, government sectors, stakeholders, and dissemination to the public. Uh, but there's First of all, there are some enabling environmental factors that need to be taken into account. Um, 
in order to have an ad suitable or effective communication strategy um, for these systems. Well, obviously, you need to have a clear governance structure. Uh, we need to know who is responsible for what, um, and therefore understanding the roles and the institutional, um, the roles of institutions and the people within the institutions. There needs to be political independence. That means that we need to make sure that polit political interests are not influencing or bias the communication of our systems. Um, if there is already a cross-sectoral collaboration environment in a country, that facilitates things greatly. There might be already groups set up that are discussing many other issues, like the One Health groups, for example. And this could be the basis for improving communication or setting a good communication system for early warning systems. Um, obviously, the legislation and having a good legislation framework is important. So everything we know that whatever strategy we come up needs to be supported by the legislation or can fit the legislation. And then obviously there needs to be adequate infrastructure and communication. Um, in terms of infrastructure, obviously a few words on digital communication. We feel that this is not indispensable. Um, it's not a, a, a requirement. But it's important because it could facilitate things. Um, particularly, it will make communication a lot faster, reduce timelines, which is really important. We're talking about early warning system of anim uh, animal health threats, but also ensure consistency and anchoring of flows. So it's not the same thing, information that is secondhand because somebody's telling you of someone who has told him, rather than communication that you're reading from the government website. Okay that we know we can trust and, and is reliable. And th that's, um, that's the important thing. It's more important that the communication is well-defined and well-trusted that um, having a, a right, um, efficient mode of communication. Um, in terms of <clears throat> organizational processes for communication, well, the first thing you need to culture will need to decide on the communication strategies for these systems and this will need to be include multiple diseases other animal health threats and even unknown threats this is the for example the case of bsc where you have a completely unexpected pathogen that happens so how do you communicate these these emergencies with so much uncertainty around um and therefore i think it's important that these communication strategies are co-created between the industry governments and others um, and we need to know what are the enables, enablers and barriers for such communication, who can facilitate and who can block them. Uh, and therefore, we need to understand what are who are responsible for what, who doing some kind of stakeholder mapping as a first stage will be essential. So we know exactly who is involved in communication or who should be involved. And if there is no one involved, deciding that we need to create groups to ensure this efficient and effective communication and that these groups and these people have legal powers as well so that their authorities recognize um, in terms of what this communication strategy should include obviously it needs to include requirements for um, workforce requirements uh, not only from the government but also from the private private sector so how is the industry going to help or going to participate in these kind of early warning systems what are they gonna, how are they going to provide information or interact with the government. So stakeholders engagement is very important and cross-sectoral collaboration as well. There will need to be considerations for training, who has to be trained and communication is not an easy exercise. Sometimes you need to have the right expertise to have the right communication, particularly with sensitive matters as disease emergence. And you need to have SOPs and ensure the right timelines are set up. And as a minimum, we need to ensure that these communications do reach national all hazard teams and national disaster management and reduction authorities, but also reach the institutions where there are communication agreements, such as the um, World Organization on Animal Health and neighboring countries. Um, and finally, it's important that uh, maybe you don't see it because you have my video here, but that there's an evaluation process. Every communication needs to be evaluated, ensuring that it's actually being effect effective and efficient. So these are continuous mechanisms of trying to understand how the communication has gone 
and how can it be improved? And this needs to be done again between all the stakeholders. Um, so um, the other thing is about communication systems. So in terms of workflows, um, obviously the communication needs to have a bottom-up and top-down approach uh, between sectors and within sectors. But there are a few things that are important for everyone, and this is that communication needs to be open and needs to be clear. Um, uh, in terms of what are the outputs uh, uh, of surveillance or the early systems or the risk assessments. There needs to be regular coordination planning and review meetings. These have need to be in place in order for these communications to happen and be um, uh, to, to be improved. And there needs to be operational processes as well in place, which include things such as um, how do we evaluate the quality of the data? or the performance of the warning system, okay? And uh, obviously everything needs to be well documented. Um, so anyone can actually have access to the, to the information about it. In terms of communication or workflows within a sector, in this case, the, for example, the veterinary department, um, obviously there's a lot of information that needs to flow. And this information is not just about disease signals, um, but you, with that, there is a lot of information about the epidemiological situation, the neighboring countries, the uncertainty, any information that provides any evidence that can help the decision process and guide actions, which is basically the aim of this communication. But also things like SOPs and preparedness plans needs to be needs to flow as well. So there's lots of different information that need to be considered. Um, some countries will have a very central government and this will have the capacity to obviously to have more strategic view about the communication within the country and have the human resources to be able to provide effective communication while the bottom um, units in the pyramid um, will be able to provide the interpretation on what does these kind of early these signals means to their local area and their, their livestock units, for example, in their area. So the communication needs to reach all the units in the hierarchy. There needs to be many different ways of um, information flow, so multi-channels. If you only have one channel, it's, it's not going to, that channel might collapse and it might not work. Um, so you need to have different channels and stakeholders need to be aware of who is involved in that and respect um, the people providing this communication. In terms of communication between sectors, um, there are a few things that we felt important. Is One is there needs to be a national network already established or you need to establish one that can help setting up this. That includes understanding the different fields of expertise between people. Um, Again, communication needs to be open with feedback loops, understanding that the communication uh, is two ways and um, we need to feedback how the situation is evolving all the time, understanding who are the points of reference for intelligent sharing, but also considering the cultural context and equitable communication. And these bring to one health perspective. So we need to make sure that there might be um, information that might affect the environment. So are we ensuring that this information is really to the people in charge of looking after the environment, for example? Um, and some simulation exercise might be useful to be conducted to test this kind of communication flows. And finally, um, there is the section of dissemination where we talk about the dissemination to the public and other stakeholders and needs to be equitable. That means that um, um, needs to be fair and needs to be reached to everyone. We want to avoid situations where there could be speculators uh, using this information or they could, some people can get advantage because they get their uh, information before other people. And we saw that in the financial crisis, you know, lots of people profiting from that. And it's something that can ultimately damage the industry and the society. And it's not the same thing, um, the information that needs to be transmitted in peacetime than during an emergency. So we set up some co considerations about that and obviously about the obligations in terms of um, national reporting. Um, and with this, I hope that gives an overview of this chapter. Thank you very much for listening. Any question, um, and we are happy to answer. Thank you. So, um... By now, we've uh, answered your questions without answering your questions, right? I think there has been um, almost a frustration on the AIG who really wanted to dive deep into those. And just to remind 
everyone, this is not an operational guide. So we don't say in case of A, do B, then C, then D, right? That would almost be disrespectful of the different realities that countries face. But what we expect is that, as I said before, well, I said before, all countries leave this framework, we'll share those, but also the AIG, I really, I will spend this entire hour and a half thanking them. They were keen on maybe even trying to apply the framework to specific diseases, let's say even influenza, and then um, reporting those lessons. So creating those operational guidelines. I will talk in the end about what's to come to follow this framework, um, how we transform this, that is just a very high level guidance into something you can actually follow based on your circumstances. We'll get there. What I think I'll do is I will play the last one, which is how we use everything that we came, we gather up to here to then support decision making and intervention. Um, again, remembering that we're talking about the use of the information collecting surveillance to support decision making and intervention. We're not talking about in your operational guidance on intervention. But the last component was prepared by uh, FAO's Emergency Management Center representative who was in the expert advisory group and tried to link this to the work that FAO, uh, the guidance that FAO also provides on uh, acting on interventions. So I'll play that last one and then we'll have the last of the time today just for discussions. And I will only use the last five minutes to wrap up and give you information about what's to come next. Good day. My name is Susan Minsterman from the FAO Emergency Management Center, EMC, and I have been asked to present this last component of the early warning system framework, the intervention component. My presentation will be very short because the early warning system framework does not actually include the actual interventions, but it will explain how this leads to taking the decisions to do such interventions. In this slide, we have summarized the impact of this component, which is that the data collected from risk assessment and surveillance can provide the information to decide to proclaim an alert or an animal health emergency or not. The outcome, therefore, will be that authorities have sufficient information to take decisions. For this, an enabling environment needs to be in place, such as technical independence of the decision makers, a legislative framework that supports the implementation of interventions, and stakeholder engagement and involvement. Therefore, the EWS provides all the elements that need to be in place to be able to decide on appropriate measures to mitigate risks and to control outbreaks. One of the most important elements of this component is again communication, or rather the information flow leading to interventions. And they have been, the, the sort of the mechanisms have been explained in the previous components, particularly in the surveillance and the risk assessment component, which lead to information from those components has to go to the decision makers in a, in a way that is easily understandable and well analyzed and well prepared for them to make the right decisions. The, these decision makers also need to know their roles and responsibilities, and that can of course be best achieved by training them and by developing standard operating procedures, which are well laid down so that in case decision makers as pers persons change, which is quite often in the case, they find the right advice and the right guidance in written form. Alerts will then be raised when the information provided triggers them, for which we have to define either thresholds or specific disease scenarios <clears throat> so that these trigger points to call a suspicion an alert phase become very clear. Also, 
there need to be set certain preconditions for interventions to take place. One of which is that emergency response plans, or often also called contingency plans, must be available. They must either be generic, so dealing with diseases that are at least in the beginning unknown or emerging, or disease specific, such as FMD, PPR, and others. The response mechanisms, mainly preventive, during the alert phase should be well established with the aim to control or <clears throat> yeah, to, to control the outbreak before it becomes an emergency. However, should this outbreak become an emergency, the control measure mechanism must also be very well known and written down in the emergency control plan, emergency response plan. Another precondition is that the stakeholders must be engaged and particularly the local communities when it comes to, the in, to implementing the interventions at farm level. Training of the workforce, as we have mentioned already, to be deployed should take place during peacetime. And the emergency response plans and SOPs should be continuously improved. This can be done through after action reviews once the emergency response plans or the SOPs have been used in an outbreak or in an emergency. If this is not the case, then it would be best to test the plans through simulation exercises. Testing the emergency response plans, of course, includes testing communication channels, which are the same as have been described under the EWS and therefore indirectly the EWS is also tested during such simulation exercises for contingency plans. Of course, one major precondition is the availability of resources. Those are either physical resources, for example, an emergency operations center or human resources to be deployed, finances, of course, and materials. And those can be either personal protective equipment, but if the mitigating or the intervention measure is, for example, an emergency vaccination, then of course also all the vaccination equipment and of course surveillance equipment. We've tried to visualize this cycle of continuous communication flow between the decision makers and the previous components such as surveillance activities and risk assessment, but of course uh, communication between them. And on the left side, you see some of the thresholds or the disease situations that will lead to certain decisions to be made, either no intervention or during the alert phase preventive. Uh, or risk reduction measures, or if it is a full-blown emergency, then appropriate interventions, as I mentioned, such as emergency vaccinations, movement control or movement ban, and quarantine. If there is an emergency, it is good to know what happens after the early warning system has done its good job. So I've put the EWS here on the slide that characterizes our flagship tool, the GEMP, Good Emergency Management Practice. And very clearly, you will find the EWS in the peacetime period, because one a good EWS <clears throat> is also helpful to maximize animal health through a multi-hazard approach and a risk reduction strategy. If the early warning system has detected a case or a suspicious case that surpasses the threshold to announce the alert phase, and if there is again, you know, the passing over the threshold to an emergency, then the EMC has developed documents and tools that focus specifically on these two phases of the GEMP, which is the manual for the management of operations 
of animal health emergency and as the title says already it really focuses on the measures that should be taken or rather in our terminology now on the interventions that should be taken when there is truly a crisis once the crisis has passed by and the reconstruction phase starts the emc has developed a document to implement an after action review and as i've explained before this is very important to continuously improve the early warning systems but also the management of emergencies so as i said the the, the true or the practical interventions are not elaborated in our document however it is underlines that the continuous supply of information on the risk situation to the managers of the emergency or the alert phase during the intervention is essential. And of course, this supply of information is described in the risk assessment and surveillance component. So the mechanisms developed in the EWS are the same that will be carried through into the alert and the emergency phase and of course stakeholders need to receive information tailored to their needs and roles equally during the peace time or the early warning system time and the emergency time so these mechanisms remain the same take-home messages therefore are early warning is only effective if it leads to early action Early warning systems should be established and fully functional, that is, receptive to signals from all components during peacetime. Early warning system capacity can be measured by improved animal health and continuous risk reduction and mitigation. Should, however, intervention be needed, FAO EMC has several tools and support available to deal with this. And with this, I thank you for your attention. I also thank you for your attention. I thank Suzanne for representing this team. Before I completely open up again for uh, discussion, I just want to leave you with this visual of the... I think I'm wrong. Um, just wanted to leave you... Oh, sorry, I don't, <laughs> I don't seem to be able to do this right. Um, this should work, right? Um, Marta, are you seeing just the one slide with the framework? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to leave you with this vision uh, and this reminder that the AG felt strongly that one, this framework isn't a cycle, and two, it isn't just about emergencies. So I want to point out here to this very large green part of risk reduction strategies uh, that is the backdrop of everything we're doing. Um, so all the information we're collecting should continuously support risk mitigation strategies, um, whether an emergency is declared or not. And the framework also has provisions for documenting decisions not to trigger emergency, what to do in peacetime, what kind of communication and dissemination to do in peacetime, what kind of preparedness to do in peacetime. Um, so I'm very uh, thankful that we could co connect this work to the default work that supports emergencies, but also keep in mind this is not the only end goal. And in fact, that was one of the things that was pointed out as a difference between this and traditional disasters. There is no end goal. There is no, uh, there, you know, there is the tsunami and that was that. Um, there is a continuous work to mitigate risks and it's hard to declare when the, when the event is here. Um, so I just wanted to leave those last thoughts while I open again for discussion. You know I will fill up this time talking if you don't talk. So save me from myself and <laughs> come on with discussions. Smile, please. Yes, I can. Uh, perhaps I can simulate the discussion again. But uh, just to provide one or two comment, and uh, that's really uh, 
uh, I'm happy to see all that good development and thanks to all colleagues working on that since. And I'm seeing a lot of connection and synergy between the different component and helping really to find or uh, fine tune this, uh, this, this framework. Uh, just one comment uh, for also to consider like on the communication, and I like the last slide that Suzanne presented that will summarize all the different action from the early warning to the response and the recovery part from the peacetime to really uh, the emergency or not situation. Uh, having link it with that one, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, with an information sharing system. It's really important because if we have an information sharing system and starting from the surveillance, from the different type of surveillance, we can generate data, we can generate information. But with the use of the real-time reporting system, the early warning system we will establish, can help to quickly generate early alert or share that information. It's really important because if you have a surveillance system using the uh, paper report, you have the information system, you are not using some of us uh, asking for the artificial intelligence or using the real-time reporting system, the technology can trigger and really um, help really to boost and establish this early warning system. Sometimes the technology can be a good opportunity, can be also one of the key elements need to be integrated in the information sharing system. That's just one comment to see that uh, it's important sometimes to link with uh, the system, integrated technology, innovation, and all that one, and this intelligence that is where really that can uh, help also and be a key component on this early warning system. Uh, thank you to all for really this nice presentation. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, Smila. Um, and I'm glad that you should introduce yourself. Uh, so Madhur did the, the opening remarks for us, but uh, Smila is uh, the, lead, the alternate lead technical officer of this project. Uh, so I'm glad Smila um, and we had the chance, people had the chance to, yeah. to see your intervention. Uh, Andrea, please. Yeah, hello, everybody. I uh, just want to highlight the uh, difficult for, for me to decide what was a component and what was an activity or something that uh, is within the enabling environment. So enabling environment is, 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 is a key issue here. It's very important. We focus on the presentation on the component, of course, by enabling environment, uh, I mean, things that are inside the enabling environment, they, they have to be present to perform the four components. So it's very important also to focus on, on, on this because uh, when they are not present, they are excused to not properly perform one of the components. So just want to highlight difficult for me to, to decide what to put in the components or what to put in the enabling environment. And there was mentioned, um, funding in the in the chat or in the QA can't remember but of course all these components uh, happen and can be done only if there is a proper enabling environment in each in each country so just a general comment and to uh, uh, to focus on this thanks thanks Andrea and uh... Kat, please, um, I was going to put you on the spot if you didn't come off, so I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Um, so I was very fortunate to be part of the external advisory group, predominantly on the surveillance and risk um, components that we've discussed today. And I thank my colleagues who are not online for presenting on behalf of those subgroups. Um, just going back to Andrea's point on the enabling environment and how it connects to one of the very first things discussed today was that baseline assessment of where individual countries are. Yes, this is a framework to support improvement, but one of the most single important aspects of the enabling environment is recognizing what you have already and not anticipating to completely reinvent the wheel. We know, and I'll speak on behalf of my own country, um, England and a small but UK, although I know there are other representatives from other UK um, organizations online, that we don't get it all right. 
but we do things some things right and every country will be in that situation so when you are looking at enhancing your early warning systems to recognize those wins you have or what what has what is the great foundations that are in place i'm loving the conversation in the chat about the importance of trust um, in surveillance activities um, and it's stretched across all the components we've discussed today and maybe that is one of the most important aspects of the enabling environment is trust within your own sectors and between sectors um, and how uh, we can enhance early warning and resulting action as well. Uh, Fernanda, Fernanda, I'm very happy for you to put me on the spot for other things, but I will let others from the EAG speak now. Thank you. Well, I will take the chance that you already spoke to put someone else on this spot. Uh, speaking of women, I admire and love when they take this spot. Uh, Carmen Bourdion has just uh, posted some comments and I wanna uh, use that as an excuse to emphasize. Uh, we've been talking about the enabling environment and the AG had a chance to leave comments on those throughout the chapters. Uh, but one thing I haven't highlighted yet is that um, Carmen Bullion and her team at FAO are going to work on an annex for the framework that is the legislative framework. Um, so. Is specific that is specific part of the enabling environment and Carmen just posted um, that it would be useful to listen from the experts how legislation can support community empowerment and engagement to act in stages of detection communication and response uh, so I realize we haven't specifically discussed that in the AIG and we won't be able to do that in the last uh, seven minutes but I will work with Carmen's team or other I will let them work uh, and the annex they come up with, I'll circulate on the AIG, but maybe we can, uh, I, I've created a document for the AIG to post things that they think are still missing on the framework. And maybe Carmen, I will put a question, I will post your question there specifically um, so that the AIG can respond to your question while, or maybe we can even have a, a, a meeting of a small group of interested people with Carmen's team um, who, who is developing that legislative framework. So Carmen, I'm not answering your question. I'm promising that I will ask the AG to look at your question while you work on this annex of the legislative framework. And the other thing that Carmen uh, posted that I will pick up on because it has come up on the chat is the, the issue of the One Health um, and, and how it can be incorporated in the framework. So when you guys finally read the framework, you see that a lot of the things that are there, they apply to health in general or to infectious disease in general, not only animal health. Um, while we stress the importance of multi-sector communication all the time, we didn't want to make this a framework of One Health at the risk of the capacity to detect diseases in humans really dominating the narrative. Um, one of the women I really admire uh, and just spoke uh, has said on the World One Health Congress about the, she has spoken about the importance of collaborating, but it's still being able to respect each other's expertise. So I believe that there is a role to strengthen animal health on its own within a One Health approach, but not letting the One Health uh, completely overshed the need for us to be able to do early warning of animal diseases, not only when they hit humans. Um, so I think there is uh, there is a space for us to strengthen animal health uh, early warning systems. And that's why this framework is going to continue to focus on animal health while being inserted in the One Health approach. Um, and because we only have five minutes left, I will take this stage again um, just to tell you what you can expect from this framework then. I've been presenting to you these components, um, but just for you to know how the document looks like. So the document as a whole has one chapter for each of the components you've seen today, but of course it has the typical uh, preamble scope, uh, the target audience, who is this framework for, how to use the theory of change. It has a, a specific session on how to use, how to navigate this framework. And it has an introduction on early warning in animal health, uh, where we try to clarify the context for this and how we've translated the disaster risk reduction framework into this. It's also largely based on a literature review of early warning that Marta Mendes, who has been supporting me throughout these webinars has done. And I really want to applaud her here uh, because despite her being very young uh, professional, she has helped us a lot. And after the components, then uh, it has a short text on systematic evaluation, review, and planning. Uh, 
and then the annexes, uh, which I mentioned, the legislative framework. But we've been talking, I just wanted to show you this. I know you can't ex exactly read, but just to show you, because as the EIG representatives have been uh, presenting the components, they've been referring to these numbers, and maybe that wasn't made super clear. For each of those components, we try to structure everything numbered. So we have, you know, the S1. So surveillance is the S chapter. We didn't number them because, as I said, this is not a cycle. We wanted to veer away from the idea that you do one, then you do two, then you do three, then you do four. So they are they are labeled with letters. So there is S for surveillance, and then you have S1 is this is reporting, S2 is complementary strategies for surveillance, S3 is diagnostic capacity, and S4 is use of this information for early warning, and you go on. So you have the R chapter for risks, and you have R1, and we think each of those sect sections, the recommendations are also uh, itemized, so A, B, and C, so that we can refer to the framework uh, saying, okay, I'm now, you know, applying for a project specific to strengthen R2 in my country. And so it goes on for every chapter like that. Um, and the one of the annexes of the framework is a table of all these <clears throat> components of the framework so that they can be tabled. So we can now have these on the left hand side. And then right now on the right side, you're seeing the expected outcomes. Uh, but you can imagine that we can put here on the right side, the legislation, the workforce capacity needs, um, the, the diagnostic needs, all the enabling environment will be tabled across these. Um, and this is a bit of from the chapter from how to navigate this framework, <clears throat> which I won't go into. I just wanted to finish today by restating FAO's commitment to follow up this framework with guidelines to navigate the framework. So this framework is here, it's the goal, it's the goal setting. How you get there will depend on your terrain. And we wanna respect that every country has their own roads and their own pathways, which is my metaphor for their own opportunities to go forward and their own challenge to do so and the way they can find work around those. Uh, so we are committed to support countries in leaving this framework and developing tools that allow them to do so. I'm also happy to announce that the EIG has renewed their commitment on trying to support with those tools. So we'll, re we'll put up a call for the EIG to renew their commitment for next year as we continue working together towards these tools. I really ask you all to applaud the EIG who has supported us up to here. This is just the beginning. Thank you all for your attention.